Let me get that going too. We are live. Let's see if that's going to help. Maybe a little bit. Maybe not. Okay, we're going to get rid of this. We're going to get rid of this green screen. It causes nothing but problems. There we go. And we're off and running. Much better. Can't see. Cameron's much happier. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? I uh, hope this is a, I don't know, Tuesday or Wednesday night, something like that. What, what, it is Tuesday. <laughs> Not hump day yet. Hopefully, you guys are all doing well. Tonight, I want to talk about adjustable intake manifolds, and we got some dining results that we want to talk about on that because I just put up a video comparing the adjustable manifold, the performance design intake manifold. The the carbon PTR intake manifold with a cool carbon fiber, you know, has all carbon fiber goodness. The carbon fiber lid, and then it has adjustable stacks inside so we can change the runner length. So I did that video, posted that today. You guys can look at that. I also want to talk about another similar test. I did another one with their that manifold, their LS3 version before when I did the, all the big intake manifold tests. And then I also did this with a fast, uh, adjustable fast manifold too. And more of a change on the fast because the change in runner length was greater the way that they configured their intake manifold. So there's, there's a bigger change. And we want to talk about that a little bit. But before we get into that, what I want to talk about is um, <laughs> don't, don't quote your heroes. <laughs> and what I mean by that is because I, I got an interesting story that I want to tell you about it. So the, so we'll, to start off with, I have people that um, I see on social media and stuff like, well, Richard Holder says this, <laughs> not that I'm somebody's hero, but um, that alone isn't reason enough to give validation to the thing that you're saying. So if it, even if it comes from me, really, even if it's accurate, it doesn't, that's not enough validation. Same thing if it comes from, you know, I get people all the time telling me when we're having a conversation on the live feed or in person or in any of the comments or whatever, um, when, when I'm at the SEMA show, people want to come up and for some reason want to have discussions about testing that I did. Um, and, and they will invariably quote some cylinder head expert or some turbo expert or camshaft expert or whatever, the, whatever the expert is. Well, this guy says this. O okay, that's fantastic. But when I'm having a conversation with somebody about something, even if I disagree with them, what I want and and what I try to provide, if I'm if I'm giving uh, providing information, is I try to provide data. So I don't doesn't matter to me that someone's opinion that a coyote is better than an LS or, or an LS is better than a coyote, or cathedral port heads are better than rec port heads. Whatever their opinion is, that's a different thing. And so a lot of times, but a lot of times they try to add value to the thing that they're trying to tell you with the help from oh well. You know, this guy says Michael Jordan is the best basketball player ever. I I tend to agree with that, but it, but it, it doesn't matter that it came from somebody that has you know you know has stepped up in the hierarchy of whatever the thing is that we're talking about. And and I'll tell you what I'm I'll tell you what I mean. So the this is an interesting story, and this happened to be way back, and it just goes to show you that even the legends in the industry. Um, can be wrong. We all can. I've been wrong many times and, and not that I'm putting myself in that group. I'm just saying that everybody as humans, we always, we, we make these mistakes and we, and, and we hopefully learn by them. And that's, that's called experience. And then hopefully you grow from that. But um, long ago when I was working for Muscle Mustangs and Fast Forward, well, I wasn't working for them. I was freelance, but I did a, I did a series of stories with the guys from Kenny Bell. Kenny Bell makes twin screw superchargers. Twin screw superchargers <laughs> are better, more efficient than roots blowers. If you look up any society of automotive, and that's not my opinion. If you look up any society of automotive engineers, papers, dissertations, evaluations on the two forms of supercharging as absolutes, one of those is more is a more efficient. One of those is a compressor. One of them has internal compression. One of them does not. The the more modern roots superchargers, if you see them, what they've done is evolved toward the design of the twin screw by having more than two lobe rotors, multiple lobes, twisting the lobes like a twin screw. And so they're they're trying to make their roots blower more efficient and 
and making it like a twin screw is a step in the right direction. It just shows where the where the bar is, and then you're trying to get to that. And so that's not again, that's not. I don't have any skin in that fight or any skin in that game. Sorry, I'm mixing my metaphors. But so I, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. But back then, when I did the testing with the guys from Kenny Bell, we were upgrading a factory Eaton supercharger. One of them was on a Lightning. The other one happened to be on a Celine Mustang, which was already not a factory blower, but uh, an upgrade that Celine had done to a modular four. And I don't remember if it was a, it might've been an M90. It was either an M90 or 112, I think. And, and the same thing with Lightning. So we did a series of stories with the guys from Kenny Bell where we replaced the factory Eaton superchargers after, after putting pulleys on them, spinning them up and doing all the things that you do, a bigger air intake on it, you know, put headers on it. If you want to put cams on it, whatever, all that stuff's fine. But ultimately the size of the supercharger, just like we found out recently with the M90, we're trying to get to the limit of the flow limit of the M90. And you find out that, hey, this size supercharger will support this kind of power range. We, we went to great lengths on the M90 to try to extract everything out that we could, including porting the blower and stuff. And, and that's all good. But at some point, it's just the size that it is. It's a positive displacement blower. If you spin it this fast, if you're getting enough air in, it produces this much airflow and it, it will support this much power. The twin screw, on the other hand, and, and this is the interesting part about it, is not only did I... Uh, or not not I, all I was doing was there, I mean, I was helping, but I was covering the story, basically covering the upgrade. So they were doing a blower upgrade. So they were putting, not only replacing the roots blower with a twin screw, but the twin screw was also bigger in displacement. So it was, it was bigger and more efficient. And so not surprisingly, it made more power and it had the capability to make more power. One of them was bigger, one of them was more efficient. And so it could make more power than the other one. And we did this twice. We did it on the Lightning. We did it on whatever the Celine upgrade was. And then so I did these stories for Muscle Mustangs on it. And, and lo and behold, the, the guys from Magnuson, specifically Jerry Magnuson, uh, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, cause I, and I like Jerry. I got, I got along with Jerry until he did this thing. Um, but he, he, for some reason, this, this, stuck with him and he was convinced that I was wrong about this. And I said, look, I, you know, cause we had phone conversations. Um, and I said, look, I, I, I know who I'm talking to. I know what your history is. You don't have to try to impress me with lineage. I said, but I will tell you this, that what I'm saying is not wrong. I said, I have all of this data to back it up. And I said, and nobody, really nobody that understands supercharging, nobody in their right mind would ever say that a smaller roots blower is somehow going to be better than a bigger twin screw blower. I said, it's just not, that makes no sense at all. That can't be right. Even if I'm not a supercharger expert and a legend in the industry, I know that I'm right here. And, and it went so far as that the Jerry Magnuson set up a meeting with the magazine people at the time, with the editor and the publisher, and they brought me in, tried to call me in on the carpet, which was funny because I didn't even work for them. I was freelance. He was trying to get me fired. And it, it would have, which have, again, it would have done no good because I didn't work for anybody. But I agreed to go in and uh, Jim Bell and I think Ken came with me and we we brought in a, a file folder, not a folder, a box full of all the data that shows here are all the dyno runs. Here's all the date because they data log everything. Here's all the data logging. Here's the charge temperature. Here's the air fuel. Here's the timing. Here, here is all the test data. And so, I mean, this is silly. What, what, what Richard put in the story was essentially what happened when we did the testing. There's no way that this can't be accurate. But Jerry Magnuson and the guys from Magnuson brought in the the blower expert from Eaton and then the blower expert from Celine and their engineers and they're telling me all about these these you know adiabatic efficiencies and isotropic efficiencies. I'm like, look, I said all of this stuff is fantastic, and I said, and I love all this stuff. And unfortunately for me, the the publisher certainly, and to some extent the editor at the time didn't have my background in testing and didn't understand it at the level that I did and, and couldn't, 
you know, wanted to, didn't know who to believe basically. And I'm like, look, this is an easy thing to solve. Let's go over right now. Let's go to Kenny Bell's. We'll get back on the, on the dino jet and we'll duplicate the test. I said, and, and you guys can be there. You guys can make sure that everything that we said happened, happened and that the test was done exactly like it was. And then the results will be exactly the same because there's no way that they can't be they're like I said, it's, it's bigger and it's more efficient. Even if it was just bigger, it would be better. Even if it's just more efficient, it would be better, but it's two things better. And so there's no way that that could be wrong. And they, they hemmed and hawed and, uh, and eventually they had to acquiesce because they knew that what I said, look, I'll go do this right now. I said, I'm, I'm confident enough that this will, this is, this will definitely happen. And they wanted to go into all of this, all of these new superchargers and that, that, you know, they kept bringing up the fact that Magnuson is an OE quality blower. And I like, look, all of these tangents, that, all these tangents that you guys are going off on, they're all fine and dandy, but they don't change the reason that we're having this meeting. So you can try to add up all the ammunition that you want on your side and you could be a legend and you could have OEs working with you and you could do all that. But that doesn't change the discussion that we're having about you saying that the data that I have here is incorrect because I'll go duplicate it right now. And so eventually they had to acquiesce and say, look, OK, <laughs> this is right. We, we, what it turned out to be is that they were just angry that we did a, a story that so somehow they thought put their product in a negative light. Now, again, I don't understand if it's an M90 or a 112 and we put a 2.8 liter Kenny Bell on it. I mean, how do you, how does that not be better? But the takeaway from all this is that, and, and this, and, and I honestly think that this happened, unfortunately, or, or, or that they expected this to happen, that when, when we all came in the room, I think that they expected the voice of the legends there and the engineers to be heard louder than the person that, that actually had the data. And so that's why I say when you're having a conversation with somebody and, and they tell you, Hey, look, this person said this. Okay. But, but let's still not dismiss each side. Let's go get the answer. Let's figure out what it is. Let's go to the dyno. Do try why headers actually make more torque than four into ones? We have to have a discussion about that because as an absolute, that's probably not the case. Do longer rods do anything? Do shorter rods do anything? Do dimple pistons? All these conversations that we have, we have to go in and get the data and find out for ourselves what happened with our data and then compare it to other people's data and go, hey, look, we got different things. Why do we get different things? Let's figure that out now. And, and one thing I was able to do in that conversation is, is completely set my, and, and this was very, very hard for me, <laughs> I was going to completely set my ego aside and just say, look, I, I want to show you that what we did was accurate. So let's go do it again. Uh, that's a uh, I'm confident in the test procedure and, and then therefore the results. Let's just go do it again. Let's all get together. Let's all be friends. I'll we'll buy lunch. Let's go do it again and, and I'll show you. And then we don't have to have this conversation anymore. It doesn't have to be this, this like ego contest thing. And, and that's why I'm, that's what I'm saying. I've had people say, Hey, look, but Richard said that all of these cams do this or to do that. <laughs> that's probably not enough in, on your side. And also it's not enough on your side. If you're having a conversation with me and saying, Hey, look, this guy said this, or this guy did this, that's fine. That's something to talk about. Let's talk about that. But what I said is not absolute. And what they said is not absolute. Let's just go find out if, if there is an absolute, and then let's find out what that is. So now we can, I just wanted to tell that story because it was an interesting thing that happened way back. Um, the, the data always speaks the loudest. And, and that's why I, that's why I like doing what I do on the dyno. Even with that, even when we get actual dyno results, you still have to <laughs> figure out if it's, is that a hundred percent? Is it 80% of the time? Is it, is it some of the time? And then what are the things are you that you are attributing to when you get the res, when you get the results? What do you attribute those results to? What actually changed? That's why when you do these kinds of dyno testing, and and you try to change one thing at a time, 
that way you can go look and, and an ABA test is even better. So if you make a change and you did something and it made a change, it changed the power up or down or whatever. And then you go, okay, that's weird. Let's go back to where we were. And it doesn't go back to where you were. Then you're, then you're like, okay, well, something else changed in the combination that wasn't the thing that we changed. So we can't attribute it just to that. But that's better information to have than to go, oh, look, a change. We got a whole bunch of power. I see this a lot in um, chassis dyno testing, unfortunately. We'll see a guy make a run, and then if they just make a change, and then they attribute this, oh, look, we or, or do it even on a different day. Oh, we did this, and it did this later on day. I'm like, look, that's a different day. Did you rebaseline the car? Is it exactly the same? Was the tire temperature the same? Was the air temperature the same? Was the transmission temperature the same? You know, all of these things. It's much harder to control all that on a chassis dyno. And I see guys going down the road of what I think is an inaccurate assumption based on the data that they got because I don't think that they did an actual direct back-to-back -back test. And, and I've had that conversation with a lot of people or the other thing that happens is they change two things and you go, okay, well, you, what else did you change? Oh, well, we didn't change anything. No. What else did you change? Well, we've changed the headers too. <laughs> That's the second thing. So now which one of those things do we attribute that to? But we're not talking about that. What we are talking about is runner length. So I put the video up on the performance design intake manifold. And the interesting thing about that test, was not so much that we got more power on top from a short runner manifold. We kind of expect that now. In fact, the only thing that I wonder about when we do a shorter runner on, first of all, very cool, carbon fiber, you know, looks awesome, adjustable manifold, even better. When we did the shorter runner, it made more power up top. Spoiler alert for the guys that haven't watched the video yet. That's pretty normal. It's happened every time we've tested it. My only question when we're doing that is, okay, now what is that crossover point going to be? Where did it start when we shortened the runner? Where did it start making more power? Where did this combination actually want the shorter runner? Here's why I say this. When we, if you do a, a combination and you're running your motor to 7,000 RPM and the shorter runner doesn't make more power until 6,800 RPM that's and, and makes less power everywhere else, that's probably not a good combination for you. So on the on the performance design intake manifold, so we had our 5.3, we had that LS3 stage four cam from BTR, which is a pretty good size cam, getting up near the limit of what will actually fit, especially since we milled the heads. Those are the trick flow heads that, that the guys from Brian Tooley ported then. They were as cast and then now they're ported versions, so they flow a lot. So can more than take advantage. One thing I didn't look at, now that I think about it, that I wish I would have, is I wanted to look at the port match down the runner because when the lid's off, you can do that, especially in short runner form. We probably could look down the runner and see how well the, the molding <laughs> on the head, how, how, how the port spacing was rel relative to the cylinder head. Did, did they you know, what were they offset? Was there an edge there? Was the sizing right? You know, I want to see how well they matched up. I didn't do that, but I can check that because I think the manifold's still there. So we can check that. But so we have that manifold. I mean, we had that motor. We put the we put the manifold on. We ran it with the longer runners and then the shorter ones. And I think it was only like, I want to say it's like an inch and a half or two inches. It's not very much of a change in runner length. Not like the fast one that we're going to talk about. And so we changed that and picked up like, 10 or 12 horsepower at the top. The odd thing though, and, and we're going to talk about that on the fast, is that we didn't really lose any power down low. We lost power in the middle. We lost like 15 or between 16 or 17 foot pounds as a little bubble kind of like right in the middle part of like around 5,000, 5,500. So that was odd. That's that's the when we do these runner changes, we you kind of see a sine wave. And then when there's a sine wave that happens either before or after that, the crossover will be what one was going high when the other one was going low. So you see a, you know, like I said, it looks like it looks like a little bubble there. But the interesting thing is down low, there wasn't really a big change. And we started out at 32 or 3300. So maybe down lower, which if a guy that has the kind of combination that we had. 
um, with those kinds of heads and that camshaft and that intake manifold is not going to worry about power at 2000. You shouldn't be because it's not going to be very good. <laughs> it's not going to be very drivable down there. It's This is definitely stick car drag racing kind of application because we were running at the 75 or 7600. Um, but, the, but the shorter runner did make more power. And other than that area right in the middle, didn't seem to pay a big penalty below 5,000, just that weird spot in the middle, um, and then more more peak power. And and only by a little bit from like 52 or about, no, 5,500 or so on up, a couple of horsepower, and then more as we got out farther in the rev range. If you wanted to go to 8,000, definitely is the manifold, the short runner version of that, is definitely one that is definitely the one to go to. And as an interesting side note, I also did the adjustable runner thing test when we when I on the big LS3 intake test that I have up. So we ran it with a um, we ran this with a 6.2 LS3 uh, with a cam in it. The heads had been freshly redone, so it was in good shape. And when we ran it with a long, the fast manifold basically with a 105 millimeter throttle body, this was an adjustable fast, but the long runners were the same as the as the regular fast is. So it made 585 horsepower and 534 foot pounds. And then that was with the long runners. Then when we put the medium length runners in, so they're slightly shorter than the long ones, power went up to 593. So we were up eight horsepower at the peak, but we were down from 534 to 513 foot pounds. So we were down 21 foot pounds of torque and down through most of the curve. And then when we put the shortest runners in there, we made 603. So compared with the long runners, we were up almost 20 horsepower, but <laughs> we were down 38 foot pounds of torque because it didn't even, it didn't even make 500, it made 496 foot pounds. And if you compare the long runner to the short runner on that fast test on that 6.2, the crossover point was 6,600 RPM. So the long runner made more power, even though it made less peak power, it made more power than the short runner did up to 6,600 RPM. And so again, you have to ask yourself, well, yeah, the it would be nice to have almost 20 more horsepower, 18 horsepower more. But <laughs> at the cost of lots of torque, almost 40 foot pounds. I'm sure it was 40 foot pounds somewhere in there. And you would lose torque from everywhere below 6,600 RPM. So that's a hard trade-off to swallow. You know, if it's a little bit, if you don't lose very much, like the test with the performance design intake manifold, the carbon PTR, that would be a, a, a harder choice. You just have that one bubble in the middle. But on this fast one, we ran the 6.2, it had a sizable change in power because we did a big change in runner length on, on the fast manifold. So well, let's see what you guys got going on. What do you guys got going on? We got to do a poll. Might, this might be a multiple poll night, too. We'll see. Do you like short runner intakes and high RPM? So are you all about the charging hard on the big end with the short runner manifolds and lots of camshaft and lots of head flow? Tim, what's going on? What about where you find out the legends are frauds? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and, and this wasn't the case, although I have to say that, um, and like I said, I, I like Jerry and I'd spoken to him many times. Um, but he's one of the guys also that told me, cause we were talking about supercharging and he's also one of the guys that told me you have to have specific camshafts to work with a, a roots blower. And I'm like, what, wh why would that be the case? Well, because of the opening and closing events and you know, you don't want to have the boost leak out and all. And I'm like, <laughs> I just wanted to shake him. Um, but, but. But I was nice, and what I what I asked for was um, dyno results. And I went through a little bit of this with uh, way back. I was going to do something with Gail Banks, and we were going to do a twin turbo, I think a small block. And I was naturally listening to him because he's Gail Banks, <laughs> and um, he was getting very specific about what heads I should use and what camshaft I should use and what intake manifold I use. And ha having back then not done the number of tests that I've run on the different combinations and stuff that I've run now, um, 
I, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I, I would have just put something together and then run turbos. And it would have been great to do something at his place with Gail because I like Gail. I've talked to him many times. Uh, and I think he's a really, really sharp guy. But the, but what we do are different things. I don't, I don't have an engineering degree. If Gail has an engineering degree, uh, I don't do stuff at that level. But I do stuff that's. I, I don't know when the last time Gail was at a wrecking yard picking up things from the wrecking yard. So we just do different things. And ha, like I said, had I done, had I done what I, uh, if I, <laughs> if I knew then what I know now, I would have just thrown together a small buck Chevy and put a turbo on it. And not worried about, I got to have this kind of head with this kind of, you know, intake to exhaust flow relationship and this kind of camshaft with this kind of lift and all. And none of that mattered. Um, <laughs> and, and Tim, and your thing about the frauds, I've, um, that, not that, not that Jerry or Gail or that qualify for that. I want to make that clear, but I have met guys that are huge names in the industry and they have been absolute zeros to me. And I, and not, not to me specifically, but things that I've been around that I know that they've done and stuff, it's just not, it's not good. Good intro to a twin screw versus TVS debate. There's not much of a debate there. Have you ever seen the variable runners that win hydraulic controlled on the 90s Mazda rotary that won? Oh, Le Mans. Yeah, no, you, uh, sliding trumpets has uh, been around for a long time. Mazda isn't the only one that uses those. All, Formula One uses those until they're outlawed. Um, it's pretty common. If you could change the runner length, it's a good deal. If you're watching the show, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button. <laughs> the data doesn't lie. Although you get guys that do lots of data stuff and then they want to either manipulate the data or structure the test so that it re, you know, we talked about this the other day about people going out and searching things to reaffirm their position and not looking for data. They're just looking for, they, they believe something is true. And so they go out and only look at the other things that say, yes, you, you made the right decision, <laughs> what you think is right. And that's not a good way to go about it. Um, if you're actually looking for data and then you have to question the data, if you find the data, then you have to question the data and you have to have more than one data. So if I show you a test of a sloppy stage two cam and it does this, and then you see one somewhere else, maybe Matt did one or somebody else did some dyno testing, look at all the data that you can and get all the information that you can and then look at the sources and look at the results and, and, you know, weed through that stuff. I'm modifying a lawnmower hood for a hood scoop when you're last live and I missed it. I got the uh, arc sunburn on my left forearm. Yep. That's it. You're just getting a good base, Dylan, right? Pre-summer. The day to speak. That's why I like your channel and pick your brain with my crazy questions. And I don't have answers to all of them, certainly not at an engineering level. And and I was watching uh, Engineering Explained or something, who, who I like. I really like the channel. And I was just getting ready to comment on something that he had said about he was comparing formula, uh, V10 Formula One motors. And he was comparing them, the torque output of the V10 Formula One motor. I'm like, why are you picking the torque output at the horsepower peak? Why wouldn't you pick it at the torque peak so you can really compare it? And then as he got through his dissertation, he said, oh, and I want to point out one thing that when I was doing my calculations, we were picking the torque at 19,000 RPM, which was the horsepower peak. And that's not really the torque peak. And so I'm like, okay, that's why I like his stuff because he, he knows. Salad bowling, a 3.9 liter Magnum. That's good. Let's talk dynamic runner intake manifolds. Those are cool. And I'm, and I will make one this year. I'm going to make a sliding runner intake that actuates while it's on the dyno. I've been adjusting my intake recently. <laughs> trying to lose weight but I'm bump rovers in the house uh, show motors were great examples they they did have dual runner stuff and and a lot of guys um the GSR had that there there are a lot of them that used um uh Ferrari did that on theirs uh they did multiple runner stuff they did there's there's lots of that stuff because it makes a big difference saw the title and my mind immediately went to the Mazda yep Remember 14, 413 cross rams on 58 Imperials. <laughs> Almost broke Nick's dyno. It's a garage dyno. I like Nick's stuff too. Continuously variable intake. That would be good. And that's how the 
the Formula One was like that. I don't know how the um, how the cycling was done on Le Mans car, um, but I know in the Ferrari stuff, um, they were not just making it long and short. They were actually cycling it to get, like I talked about, when you see the change in runner length, you get waves like this. And so they were getting the peaks of all the waves at all the RPMs. So it's that's pretty cool. Do you think runner cross section should also be changed at various RPM? Like, could the cross section change help fix flat spots in the curve? I don't, I haven't tested it that much to know what it would do specifically. I think that that would be that particular combination, and maybe you could try to fix it like that. But it's very, very hard to change to have a variable cross section tube. Uh, I don't know exactly how you do that. Unless you get something that scrunches up. <laughs> Have you seen superbike motors with movable runners? Yeah, variable runners is not this is not a uncommon thing. Flat six NASCAR motors were good examples of this. Runners tuned for low RPM around the curves. I've never seen it. I need to, I guess I need to look up slant six NASCAR motors because I didn't know that that was a thing. Just watch the Mazda from the 90s. Yep. That that Mazda motor, that four rotor sounded really good too. Throttle bodies and the intakes on those bikes. Yep. Three liter V6 from the Saturn View had a variable length runner. That's a um that's a Honda motor. The Wright brothers, is that should that be wasted two years on the wrong wing design from the Germans? Or weighted two years? I'm going to start a 454 on a six liter LS. Do you think I can reach 600 wheel horsepower with a mild camshaft? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You, you can't make a 454 out of a six liter unless you sleeve it. Um, or are you doing both of those? And maybe I don't understand. BMW, Yamaha, SHO, Mitsubishi made um, tuned runners, but has anyone ever made telescopic runners that adjust during operation? Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. The Mazda was like that. Remember the 413 cross ram on the 58 Imperial? Yes. This, are you talking about the Sonic Ram one? <laughs> it is like I never left. That's right. RC 45 Superbikes had telescopic intake runners. Yeah, bikes had a lot more technology than car stuff. Um, and uh, and then hopefully it trickled over. One of the things with bikes, and even more so than cars, is that they're very conscious of weight. So if what they were doing didn't have enough of a gain to offset the weight change, then they're probably not going to do it. Is there a realistic product to use that would allow us to bolt on variable intake runners? Do you, do you mean a sliding intake runner or do you mean a dual intake runner? What are you, what are you trying to do? How much horsepower do you lose if you do not use a divided flange on a divided flange turbo? Nothing. Honda B6. Yeah, it's a it's a J series, which is in meaning that it's an excellent engine. <laughs> I kind of lucked out and got an Eagle truck manifold with the actuators. Still planning on hogging out my Mopar dual quad, similar to the Edelbrock to fit the Eagle heads. I think of the two of those, I would pick the dual runner truck manifold. I we've tested that and that works really good. Uh Tariq, so you're gonna you're gonna do a 454. I have a video up where we made 700, a little over 700. When I say we, I mean Brian Tooley did. He He's the one that designed and built the motor. All I did was test it. So 700 flywheel would be 600 at the wheels, and it was a 454. And I'm sure now he would do it differently. And he made it so that, not for maximum power, he made it and, it and it went in a Corvette and drove around on the street. Three liter V6 was a GM deal. They use it in various Opal and Sobs too. The later models are used. 3.5 V6. Well, the J series also came in a 3.2 and a 3.0. So are you sure that that's not a Honda one? 
512 Mopar stroker with a ported cross ram, high torque cam, and ported Brodex B1 heads. Or what? What is your question about that? One divide is for the left bank, and the other is for the right right bank. So you're are you going to run the exhaust divided into the turbo? I don't do that, and I run a lot of divided turbo housings just on an open. I, I have a a three inch V band to T4 or three inch V band to T6 uh, adapter that I use to depending on what turbo I want to mount on there, and they're just open, even though the, a lot of the housings are divided. What would be the best aftermarket fuel management system for a 383 TPI? There is no best one. Um, we used a Holly and when I when we ran it, and also a Fast, and, and all of those work. All of those will give you the air fuel and timing that you need to make that work. Actuators, as in the variable intake, but mention the dual quad because it has more sentimental value too. I have one of those dual quad Hemi manifolds if somebody's looking for that. I also have some Hemi camshafts. I could see how a given runner length intake could make more power down low, lose in the middle, and then back up top, similar to harmonics having wave cycles like octaves in sound. Yeah, it's not, the wave isn't that big though. Um, it's, it's usually... Uh, like in the ones when I did adjustable runners, depending on how much you're changing it, um, like a thousand RPM or less is the wave. And, and obviously that would be dependent on the, um, the RPM rate of the dyno too. But it's not just up in the bottom and then down in the middle and then up at the top. A given runner length usually is good in an RPM range and then not good at the top, like a longer one is. And the middle one is a little better, like on the on the fast one, the the middle length, the long length was good up to 6,500. The middle length then got a little bit better beyond that, but lost power. And then the short runner, even better beyond that, but still lost even more power. Uh, Tariq, thank you very much. Not, not necessary, but always appreciated. Let's see. The Slant 6 NASCAR motors used a four-barrel intake. They had so long of runners that the carb was way on the other side of the engine bay. I've seen Slant 6s, and the runners are pretty long. Um, and the longer the runner, the they're just tuning the intake manifold so that you have effective cylinder filling at the right engine speed. Question, what is high or low RPM? It depends. On, that's, that's a subjective thing. Some guys don't want to rev their LS motors past 6,000 RPM because they think that it's that's too high, and that's fine. I, I was that way when we ran the first Big Bang motors. We didn't run them very high. We should have. <laughs> it would actually, actually probably be better. Um, and so high is a relative thing. A couple of cool videos of a guy playing sound waves through a propane burner tube. The flame would change according to note. Yeah, there are some really, really cool, uh, videos of, um, sound waves creating levitation, which is really neat. Um, because the power of waves, it's pretty impressive. And if you look at, if you ever get a chance, look at the John Cosi thing from, from engine, the engine master, not engine masters, from the advanced engine technology conference, where he put his finger in the clear tube, the clear intake tube, and you could see his fingers going and bending farther back than it should <laughs> and bending forward and doing that through the whole RPM range. And it, it, it's amazing. And, and it, and it, until you see that, you don't have an idea of how fast these waves are traveling because it's multiple waves per valve open event. So think about that. That's a pretty fast wave. The wave's traveling at the speed of sound. There was a couple of videos. Okay. It's 54 degree V6 used from 2002 to 2003. The J-Series came in 2004, 2007 model. And in 2004, what size was the, the J-Series? I saw videos of guys claiming that by dividing the banks, the turbo responds better. I, I know that that's the, 
that seems to be the consensus in the turbo world. I've not seen an actual direct back-to-back -back test where there's something that I believe is, is <laughs> reflective of reality where they did that. I'd like to see something where, you know, cause it, what happens sometimes is people tell me, Oh yeah, we did a back-to-back -back test. <laughs> did you, did you really? Um, and it turns out to not be a back-to-back -back test. It turns out to be them wanting that to happen and then making that happen. So one of them's a hot run, one of them's a cold run, yada, yada, yada. Did you see the new J-Series J30 double overhead cam turbo engine, the Acura MDX, the blocks look pretty beefy and promising. I haven't seen that. A rolled sleeve design could be used to dynamically change the cross section. If you ever try to roll a poster, no, I know what you're talking about. That's that's hard to implement though, and I don't know what you're going to get that's going to sleeve it like that. And I don't know that I don't know that cross section. I don't know how much cross section changes that. I guess I should do a test on that. This high power at lower RPM put more stress on the motor than at higher RPM. Well, what you're talking about is torque production. And so if you're talking about the extremes, that's why they have diesel engines. So if you're making a lot of torque at very low RPM, which diesels are very good at, that's why they have to be so structurally sound. A diesel, if you look at the block, you look at the head, look at the clamping forces involved to keep the head on there, um, the, it's, it's a lot of stress. It's a lot of cylinder pressure. The hyperpaxia, yeah, I'm familiar with that because I've gone down the rabbit hole on slant six stuff. 170 slant six sport compact NASCAR Valiance. Okay, that's right. They, I, I, for some reason, I was thinking like big cup stuff, but yeah, I forgot that there were other classes back in the day. There's a Mustang kit to put the turbo in front of the rear axle, a remote kit. Have you seen conical shape runners? Yeah, taper in a runner is not very unusual. I think Darren Morgan said that they designed their pro stock intakes to have a 500 RPM difference in length for each runner and also change the cross section. I don't know what you mean by that. Are you are you talking about for they're they're making the intake manifold the individual ports effective at different rpm ranges i shift my stock yoku 4 at 6300 seems to give the best performance it depends on what camshaft you have in it and what the power curve looks like we have my l96 to 6200 and c63 during the shift seems fine yeah that's not that's not high RPM. <laughs> this is a this is a junkyard small block that I have. Uh, this um, the L thirty three is a junkyard bottom end. It has a good cylinder head and, and valve train on it now, though. Ben, you're are you, you're interested in the Hemi stuff? Uh, send me an email. Here's my email address for the Hemi guys. When would someone pick a divided housing versus open for a small T4 7875? For many turbos on VS, I see more divided housings than open options. Well, like I said, I, I, I interchange those. So I don't care which one of them is divided. And I don't care which one of them is open. I, I run them with an open entry to whatever, whatever thing, whatever the housing is. Um, I have not tried running, uh, building a custom exhaust to run it into a divided housing. In, in my opinion, you have to neck down the size of the exhaust dramatically to have the exhaust from one side of a V8 flow into one side of a T4, especially, but even a T6 turbo. It's pretty small. Uh, ben, I don't have, this is all Gen 3 Hemi stuff. It's not old, it's not old Hemi stuff. I don't have any original Hemi stuff, either 392 or 426.
Didn't Holly buy out the STS turbo company that did the rear mount turbos? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they did. There are a few guys. Uh, Jimmy is one of them who has been after me for a long time to test different. And and I since we when we started doing intake runners way back in the day, this was this goes all the way back to the. Um, I think the first one I did was for a five liter Ford. That was probably back in 80, 89, 89 or 90, I think is the first one that I did where we did adjustable runners. Cause I did an adjustable runner upper for the factory HO lower. And then I was wondering about the size of the tubing for the upper. And then especially when I was considering making another upper and mating it to the GT40. And then I thought, well, what's going to happen if I change the, because the GT40 opening is bigger than the HO is. So you'd use a different size runner. So what would happen if I use the same size runner on both of those? And so I went down the rabbit hole way back in 1989 about what would happen if I made a smaller or a bigger runner. Um, Cause we had seen, and I, I think somebody had done it um, even way back then, what they made was because porting the lower part of the GT40 or the Cobra was very easy. The guys from Extrude did hundreds of those. And so porting it, and, and on the lower, you could get to it with conventional porting, although Extrude Honing was so much easier. And then you could even out the flow and all the runners and the, the, that stuff. That was neat. But putting a regular tubular GT40 on there was still, still restrictive. But what uh, I saw somebody do is make a big tube version. It was a lot of work. Um, certainly a lot more work than just porting the Cobra upper, which, and then, and then you'd section the cut off the, the back section of the plenum and extend the plenum, make more plenum volume and all that stuff. But on the GT40, I saw a guy build a big tube version of the GT40, which I thought was genius. And I thought was necessary. And I thought that they would sell a lot of them, but I only ever remember seeing one of them. But that's the other thing that made me think, Hey, what's going to happen if we make this bigger? Now we know that the, like on the five liter, especially if we put it on a, something that has good heads, like an airflow research head, which we used a lot back in the day. And then the, then the 224 cam that we put in everything. So 185s and the 224 cam. And then uh, the big two version of the GT40 of the upper and a ported lower should work well because we know the bigger tube is going to flow more. So at the very least, we were going to get more flow. But then I wondered what's happening with all the resonance frequencies with the change in tube. Um, but despite lots of prodding from then until now, uh, I still haven't tested that. Uh, how can that be when Holly is owned by private equity? What's a fair price for an LQ9 with accessories? I don't know. I never asked the guys at the wrecking yard what they were, what they were selling for. I remember Darren Morgan said they will, they try to make a 1500 RPM window. So is that the effective operating range that you're talking about? And we'll even have camshafts with different grinds depending for each cylinder and manifold dynamics. The, the level of testing that they do, if it's, if Darren's talking about pro stock stuff, um, the <laughs> my hat's off to him. <laughs> because the number of camshafts and, and variants and, and because the thing is, if you, you test all these camshafts and you, let's say you got three or four or 500 camshafts, which is, would not at all be unusual. I'm sure for pro stock stuff. And you've tested all these cams. You're like, Oh, well, this one seems to work the best. And then you change the cylinder head. Guess what? <laughs> you have to go back and change at least a few of those cams to get back in line with whatever this new head wants and whatever the new intake manifold wants. And it's a lot of stuff. I, I would love to sit down with a guy like that and, and just listen to him talk about all of the testing that he's done. Cause I'm sure that because the, when you're looking at the, that level, like the stuff that I do, it's easy to get big power from stuff, it's, especially if you're doing boost or whatever, but, but I'm looking at all the beginning stuff, which is very easy. When I was doing engine masters, it got harder, but at pro stock, <laughs> you're, you're looking, you're spending lots and lots of money to find onesies and twosies. And it's like I said, my hat's off to guys like that. If I decide to stick with a dual quad, my plan is to make it look like it look as old school as possible. Yeah. I used to have a couple of carburetors that went on there, but I think I sold the carburetors. Uh, 
I bet that setup would cause a lot of head and exhaust pressure. What, uh, which, I don't know what combination you're talking about. Has anybody used a total street performance intake? Good, bad, decent, worth it. Would it go stock factory sealed 68 small book Chevy 307? I don't know what intake that is. Cylinder 7 might have more duration than 106 LSA, where Cylinder 5 would have less duration than a 107.5 LSA. Well, on a, if you're doing a big block Chevy, the the way that the ports are laid out on the head, obviously you have, you know, the good ports and the bad ports, and then they would adjust for that. But when they went to symmetrical port stuff, that, that become not as nearly as much of an issue. If you got an Eagle 5.7 or 6.4, would you test the Holly single plane? Uh, I'll check and see. We have already run a bunch of those, but I don't know if the single plane was available when we tested it. Will we ever get a Big Bang J series? Uh, it would happen after the K series, and that hasn't happened yet. Hafferland Performance took a bone sock J32. It was making 600 before the rings hit the wall. Um, yeah, Ish's motor, I think, made 600 of the tire, and it was all stock, and it was not opened up. Each bank of a V8 merging into a divided turbo, it seems to me that that would get really small, um, and that would cause back pressure problems, but I, you know, maybe you guys swear by it. Because if you look at the exhaust of one side of a V8, I mean, it's it's going to be at least two and a half inches, and and the the header collector would probably be more like three inches to flow. And then, you know, it's not unusual to use a two and a half inch crossover tube when you're doing turbo stuff. That's why turbo stuff is <laughs> it's like sorcery. <laughs> I don't understand how it works so well. It is, it is magic and sorcery. Do you like short RPM or, or short runner intakes and high RPM? 59% are saying yes. So we're going to end that poll. Like I said, we're doing poll on poll action today. Doing multiple polls. First time I haven't used caps. I'm not really liking that very much. But would you ever spend the money on a carbon fiber intake if it performed well? So if it had the performance, would you spend the extra money on a carbon fiber goodness? It's like turbo weight goodness, but. The new J-Series bottom end looks exactly like the LS, the turbo one that is a six bolt instead of a four bolt. So it's is it cross bolted? 3.6 Penstar Dyno. People have run 18 pounds of boost on a stock one. I'm guessing a K20 will get 1,500 before it breaks. On, on a stock piston and rod, I don't think it'll do that. I think that they're having trouble with forge stuff at that level. Vacaville Unified. I'm running six pounds on a truck Norris, six liter stock bottom end with rec port heads, GT45. I've only street tuned it with HP tuners. Any idea how much power it's making? 
I don't, I don't have any idea. Are you running it on E85? Are you running it on pump gas? I don't know how much timing you have. There'd be no way for me to know. Have you tested dynamically variable intake runner? No, I haven't run that ever on the dyno. You saw him do 14 to the wheels for a dozen passes. A stock bottom end you saw do that? One million horsepower, yep. 93 octane and 23 degrees. Yeah, I don't I don't have any idea. I can't even hesitate to guess. 23 degrees seems like a lot of timing for 93 octane. That's probably all the timing. So four seventy. I'm gonna make a guess, but it's not gonna be right. Does it have an intercooler on it? Mm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's 650 at the tire or something. I mean, not at the tire, 650 at the flywheel. Yes, on the carbon fiber intake with today's prices on go fast parts, no reason it shouldn't at least look at, oh, my light, my light. Looks like half the battle, carbon fiber alone has 10 horsepower. It, it does make a statement, obviously, when you pop the hood, assuming that that carbon fiber intake was under the hood. You don't see any uh, knock at that timing. That's good. That's a lot of timing. That should be that should be pretty much maximum horsepower for that timing. How much boost can I add to a stock 5.3 without gapping the rings? Uh, I don't know. Maybe some. Maybe none. It's rear mounted without an intercooler, and you're running that. <laughs> wow, that seems like a lot. Does a Magnum V10 share the same bell housing as a Cummins? Does anybody know? I'm thinking that it shares the same as a, since it's a, a, a 360, 318 variant. I'm thinking it has that one, but I can't swear to that. The Magnum V10 does use a Cummins bell housing. Okay, there you go. I see 120 degree inlet air temperature at, at what is the inlet air temperature? What is the air temperature? Uh, what is the ambient air temperature when you're at 120? At six pounds, it, that seems low with no intercore. Carbon fiber salad bowl. Now that would be cool. Justin in Queensland, welcome. I don't think you're going to see much of a gain from E85 unless your Holden 5 liter is high compression. I don't think you'll see much from E85. I mean, it'd be easy to try, but you have to tune it. But I, I honestly think 98s for what you're doing is more than enough. When I see these engine competitions, are they just grading by peak power? On which engine competitions are you talking about? If you're talking about the engine masters one, they have a specific RPM range and a specific average power production for that one. But I don't know about other ones. I'm off to finish the 350Z twin turbo. Uh, you painted it? Oh, cool. How's the pole such a big split? <laughs> That's right. You ever spend the money on a carbon fiber intake if it performed well? 52% saying yes. Probably like me, I wouldn't be able to buy that manifold. I've only run it since winter and it hasn't gotten over 75 degrees ambient. Yeah, that's that's just odd. Where, where are you grabbing air for the turbo? The Holden M90 straight sixes look cool. Yeah, an M90 on anything is good. The um the temperature thing just seems odd to me that that 
you would only have uh, on a 75 degree day and 120, you're, you're, that's less than, less than 50 degree change with no intercooler on six pounds of boost. That just, th those don't seem the, like the numbers that we normally get. Best chassis dyno NA I've seen of a bolt on NA Pensar. But what's a bolt on one? What what does that include? It's not cams, right? Is it ported head, ported intake manifold? What is that? And what is that motor rated at at the flywheel? So we're gonna end our pull at 53%. 52% now. It's going going back toward even. I have to say, and especially the first time I saw this performance design intake manifold, um, I was very impressed by it. <laughs> I didn't want to touch it because I knew that it was, I knew that it was way too expensive for me to be handling. And it has, it also has, it has carbon fiber goodness and it has billet goodness too, because it has a billet, um, which I like that they did. It has a billet uh, throttle body flange. All Cummins trucks start life as V10 trucks. So that do they are the Cummins swapped into them somewhere else? Then are they not built at that assembly line? Are you a sort of supporter of UPR or Steeda suspension parts from the old Mustang days? Uh, I have done stuff with both of those guys from way back. Um, I really like the Maximum Motorsports stuff. And, um, I'm supposed to do some stuff with the guys from, with Bart from Bart works. <laughs> um, he's got a double A arm front suspension that we might put on my car. And also, uh, yeah, no, this no, who is it? Oh, Kenny Brown stuff. I also put on my Mustang and then we put Celine stuff on it too, way back. Okay, so it's uh, WFO. It's build. It's grabbing air. It's grabbing ambient air. Then, right? Not not hot air from in in, in the engine compartment. Have you, you tested a Gen two and a half VS Racing seventy eight seventy five, or can it handle like a hundred more than a Gen one? I have a Gen two seventy eight seventy five, and uh, uh, I have lots of testing that we've run with it on various different motors, um, but I've never compared it to a Gen one. Bolt on is a ported intake throttle body, cold air tune stock flywheel. Matt says showed big numbers with a bigger AR. On the hot side, it, it you can see gains from a bigger AR on the hot side if you're running into um, higher exhaust uh, exhaust back pressures. That's pretty normal. We did I did a test way back in in the ooh, man it was eighty nine no it's probably in the nineties um, with one of the T three turbos from an SVO Mustang or T Bird and I ran it on my Del Sol which was a B sixteen. And there were three different hot sides for that turbo. So there's, there's a 63, a 48, a 63, and an 82. And we saw a big change in power from just changing that hot side because we saw, a, a, and we monitored the, um, the back pressure too. The back pressure is very high with the smallest housing because that particular motor could utilize everything that that turbo had to offer in terms of the, in terms of the cold side. And so we were running into a hot side flow problem. And then when we eliminated that restriction by going to bigger and bigger hot sides, then we picked up power. By the way, your ported M90 making 100 plus over NA is pretty awesome. It, it's not just 100 more than NA. It's a it's a hundred. It's it's 650 horsepower. So it doesn't matter what the NA is. I mean, it does a little bit. But um, the the thing that you should look at is on that test, that blower is flowing enough 
to support 650 horsepower. And the way that we got it to do that was by bringing the boost down, which we did by bringing the NA power up. So it's not just adding 100 horsepower. Like it wouldn't just add 100 horsepower to a 3.8 liter V6. <laughs> it, it's, it can flow that much if you do all the things to it that we did. Do you think it could have lost low RPM horsepower from poor rotor pack sealing at low RPM due to less friction area from the porting? I, <laughs> I'm having an argument right now with the guys from with the guy from Jokers about that. And I'm pretty certain it's port timing and he thinks it's parasitic loss. And I don't understand how parasitic loss can happen down low like that. It, all of and I've done a lot of a lot when I say a lot, like over the last three years, a lot of engine dyno testing, but I've also been privy to lots of actual blower dyno testing and all and I've and I've structured some of those tests because I had specific answers that I wanted. Um, so they've run uh, the guys from Kenny Bell run lots of different blowers at, at lots of different uh, blower speeds. And so this is where I'm talking about the um the difference between having data and not having data. So if you look at the actual data where you run a blower and then you run a different kind of blower and you run it at different engine speeds and different boost levels and different pressures and, and different inlets and and then you monitor the 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 parasitic loss associated with driving those blowers under these varying conditions, you start to see a trend that as you go up in RPM, parasitic loss increases. As you go up in boost pressure, parasitic loss increases. And so you start seeing things that do things. And that's why I tend to think, and I could be wrong about this, but I tend to think that this is a port timing issue with his blower. Um, I had somebody else chime in, uh, the guys from church who are churches, uh, automotive, who are pretty sharp guys to have done lots of stuff. And he said he saw a very similar thing with a, a ported, it was either a ported 2650 or a ported LSA blower that they did. And they saw a similar thing. They saw a loss in low speed power and then they saw more power at the top. And I, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm convinced that it's port timing. when Matt tested the next gen compared to the previous model. Yeah. And Viren would be able to tell you if he, I'm, I'm sure he knows what the, what the change in power is. Oh, Dylan, you're looking for an adapter to adapt the K24 to the transmission. What do you think the difference between a Vortec T trim making 660 wheel horsepower at 15 pounds going to a VS Racing Gen 2 7875 at 15 pounds? 750 is due to parasitic loss. I don't know what you mean by 750 is due to parasitic loss. Are you, are you asking me if you'll make 750 at 15 pounds? What is the NA power output? Um, you, you should make a hundred more horsepower, certainly with a turbo at that boost level compared to a Vortec. I'd like to get a square set of Pensar heads and polyquad ported like David Vizard says by making diagonal intake and exhaust valves larger. I'm gonna have to look at that. How do you pull out a C's Gen 4? Are you, are you pulling it out of the wrecking yard? Uh, Dean, yeah, on your swirl port heads, you can mill them. You could port them. You could obviously change the cam. How many Chinese made turbos have you used? A lot. Yeah, the, the original Big Bang uh, CX Racing turbos are still alive. So that was 2010. I've experimented with Cerakote. I have not. Mm -hmm. 
we've done coded headers and exhaust and things like that, but not not as a direct comparison to something else. Do you have a record of boost levels through the Dyna runs on non-ported versus ported? Might be able to prove your theory. The, the way to prove it would be to reproduce what we had before and then send them both over to Sweden and have them run on the lower dyno. Richard, I don't know if this might sound goofy, but is the GT3582 turbo too big for a D16? The RPM would have to be high before it kicks in, or nitrous have to be used to spool it. That's a 550 or 600 horsepower turbo. Are you wanting to make that much on a D16? Yeah, Dean, if you have a small block, your a cam is going to help a lot. Uh, high altitude, thank you very much. Always appreciated. <laughs> My wife will appreciate the drink that I'm going to buy for her <laughs> on date night. So on Thursday, um, we'll, we'll have two live feeds on Thursday. Thursday is going to be a sale day. So we're going to do, um, I have Hemi, I have Ford, I have LS. And then I might also have Gen 5 LT. I have some of those used cams. I'm going to get rid of all of them. So be here for that. Uh, BS. So you're going to run, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you should run as much boost as you think it'll take or as much as you want for the power that you want to produce. The GT30 be better. My buddy and I are arguing over it. I, I, I honestly think that for most people, smaller turbos, they're going to be much happier, especially if it's something you're driving on the street, because even if you're able to make 500 horsepower, if the guy beside you comes on boost earlier on his 300 horsepower motor, he's just going to destroy you because <laughs> he's going to be gone. He's going to be like six lengths up before your turbo gets going. And then you might charge by him on the big end, but it might not be for a mile or something down the road. So it's just not, it's much funner to have a responsive turbo. And then you play that game of response versus, you know, ultimate power. <laughs> teach him to break boost yeah you could do that you could power break it we've done that and on that note it's time to go thank you guys all for showing up i will be back in the morning and with another video i have a, a cam lsa video coming up that i thought that i know you guys will be happy about and other stuff as well um including a test on the intake manifold the the twisted um i'm trying to think of the guy's name who did it I don't know. I'll figure it out. But that will be, that's all coming up. But I'll see you guys all tomorrow.